You're watching the Spirit Food Christian Center Worldwide Webcast, broadcasting live every Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time. Yes, amen, hallelujah. When Spirit Food comes to you, blessings will flow. Say yes. I am a believer, not a doubter. Therefore, God's word is being confirmed in my life with signs following in Jesus name amen hallelujah and amen let's open our Bibles please to the book of Romans the fourth chapter Romans chapter 4 and we're talking about how to obtain strong faith now why is it necessary for us to obtain as believers in Christ Jesus strong faith well, because it's possible for a believer in Christ Jesus to be weak in faith. Your faith is measurable. And those that are weak in faith will not produce the same results as those who are strong in faith. And God wants every believer in Christ Jesus to be strong in faith. The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And that means if you're going to be strong in the Lord, you've got to be strong in faith. Your confidence in the Lord has to be something that you're sure of and that you are confident that the Lord moves in your life according to his word. Now we've said in Romans chapter 4, we're going to look at verse 17, how that faith that is strong is being given an example here of Abraham, our forefather. And Abraham is described as one who was strong in faith, not weak in faith, and thereby he pleased God in his faith. In Romans, the fourth chapter, looking now at verse 17, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him, whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and call it those things which be not as though they were. Who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he, that's God, had promised, he, that's God, was able also to perform. So we see here an opportunity for the Spirit of God to show us that Abraham was strong in faith, not weak in faith. And we said that there are elements that one must observe, one must partake of if you're going to be strong in faith. If you're going to be strong in faith, these are things you must know. Another way of describing it is these are things you must understand and apply. So you could write in your notes, these are things I must know, or these are things I must understand and apply. And here are the elements, just some elements of what it takes to be strong in faith. Number one, we said you must know the reality of God's word. That means you can't be questioning, doubting, or wondering if God is really talking to you when you're reading the scriptures and hearing the scriptures. If you're going to be strong in faith, you have to have this conviction that God speaks to me through his word. His word is him talking to me. And if you're questioning or doubting or wondering whether or not that the Bible is God talking to you, you'll never be strong in faith. Because Jesus acknowledged that if you're going to have strong faith, you have to have strong confidence in the Word of God. The Bible must become final authority for you. 
Now, we've looked at scriptures pertaining to this. Let's look at a scripture, just one, and pertaining to that. And 1 Thessalonians, turn over, let's look at that. 1 Thessalonians, the apostle Paul acknowledged to those believers that were in Thessalonica that they were individuals that pleased him greatly because they pleased God greatly in their attitude in that they received God's word. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians, the second chapter, we'll look at verse 13. Paul the apostle is acknowledging something to these believers there in Thessalonica. He said, for this cause, also thank we God. Now, thanksgiving to God is something that's good. Would we all agree? He said, and we're thanks we, for this cause, also thank we God without ceasing. Paul, what are you thanking God for without ceasing? Because when you receive the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Notice that Paul said, we're thanking God because when you heard us speaking to you God's word, you took it for what it really was, God's word and not the word of just men. It was God communicating to you and you received it as such and you said, God, you're talking to me. I hear your word and I'm going to take you at your word and I'm going to allow your word to be final authority in my life. And we said this book, the top of the page is acknowledging that it's written to who? The Thessalonians, right? Or the people that lived in Thessalonians. In Acts chapter 17, Acts chapter 17, verse 11, the Bible lets us know that at one time, Paul couldn't say that about those that were in Thessalonica. He had to let them know they were falling short on allowing themselves to be blessed and receiving God's best because they weren't in, compa in comparison to the Berean Christians, they weren't getting, getting after the word like the Berean Christians were. In Acts chapter 17, verse 11, the scripture reads, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Turn over and let's look at that. Acts chapter 17. Acts the 17th chapter. And the reason we're doing this is because we're establishing these things that you must know in order to be strong in faith. Strong in faith meaning having confidence, strength in God's promises to you so that literally your life will reflect the Lord working in your life. And that's really where every believer should be placing their heart. And first in the, uh, I'm going to read here in verse 10 of Acts chapter 17, verse 10. Acts 17, verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who, coming thither, went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. See, these that were in Berea said, we hear you preaching, but we're going to check out what you're saying and see how it lines up with the written word of God. They searched the scriptures how often? Daily. Daily to see whether or not those things that were said were actually so. See, this is literally a defense mechanism to keep the believer from getting off or getting onto an erroneous pathway. When you made a in your heart and in your mind that you're going to search the scriptures to see what you're being told lines up with the will of God, you're in a position where Paul the apostle says, I'm praising and thanking God for you because you're searching the scriptures to check out whether or not those things that were spoken unto you were actually so from God. See, you don't have to wonder whether or not you're hearing from the good shepherd. You can know if you get into the word of God. And so we as believers, if you're going to be strong in faith, number one, you must know the reality of God's word. You must know the reality that God speaks to you through the word. And he expects you to be a student of the word of God. Now, why does he want me to be a student? Because God will not speak to us outside of his word. 
What do you mean by that? God will never tell you to do something that's inconsistent with the written word of God. Did y'all hear that? I'll say that again. Or how about this? You repeat after me. God will never tell me to do anything inconsistent with the written word of God. So his written word lines up with his spoken word and his spoken word lines up with his written word. So you really have the capability of checking whether or not you're hearing from God when someone says, the Lord said, I'll tell you if it's the Lord or not, let me get after the word and the word will let me know if it's God. But then also I have the witness of his spirit in my heart. But the witness of his spirit in my heart should never, ever, ever override the written word of God. Is that clear? So anybody can tell you the sky is falling. Anybody can tell you that, you know, cows are causing the climate to change and all that stuff when they pass gas, that the, all of the passing of the cows, gas, is causing the world to come to an end. But that doesn't line up with Scripture. The Bible says that God sat down and rested on the seventh day because what he did, he finished it meaning that he automatically knew what was coming up when he made the cows. How do you think he's going to make a cow capable of changing what he did? Are you listening to me? So don't hand me that the world is coming to an end because cows are passing gas. I'm not going for it. You've got an agenda, and your agenda is to try to keep me from being at peace. But the Bible lets me know that if I know that God's word is God talking to me, then he'll keep me in perfect peace because my mind is stayed on him. I'm not letting somebody come up with an ulterior program to manipulate me like Chicken Little. It's not happening, not with me. Amen? And everybody should be able to say, and it's not happening with me. Amen. So to be strong in faith means I must let God's word become final authority in my life. But pastor, you really need to look at these other things that are going on because if I tell you what these other things are and let you see these contradictory circumstances, whoo, it'll make you change and it'll make you worry and you'll get out and campaign. Don't let cows pass gas. Well, I'm not going to live my life like that. I'm not going to do it because ultimately God's word is his word and he keeps his word okay number two if you're going to be strong in faith number two you must know the reality of your redemption in christ you must know the reality of your redemption in christ and what that means is I am redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Turn over to Colossians chapter 1. I am redeemed, you are redeemed, and since you are redeemed, that means you've been bought out of the pawn shop of the devil. Satan was lording over humanity without any limitations, it seems like, until Jesus came, and when Jesus came, he redeemed us from the hand of the enemy. And redeemed means that I've been bought out of the pawn shop. I've been bought out of destruction. I've been delivered from being a slave. I've been bought and paid for. And since I'm bought and paid for, I no longer belong to the devil. I'm no longer in the devil's family. I'm in God's family. And since I'm in God's family, I listen to God who is my father and I let him be the one who tells me my value and my worth. There's far too many Christians are running around downplaying themselves, talking bad about the things that God has blessed them with, talking bad about the other people that are believers in Christ Jesus because their attitude is, we're just old worms. We're just, oh, you know, we may make it in life. Look, somebody pray for me, I may make it. But no, you've got to find out from the scriptures how valuable are you? How important are you? What's your worth? And when you let God's word tell you your worth, then you can begin to hold your head up high and you can square your shoulders and you can begin to act like what you are actually are. You are a king and a priest. You have been made unto your God, your Lord under 
him, the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, you are lords under the lordship of Jesus. You are kings under the kingship of Jesus. You are priests under the priestly ministry of Jesus. So thereby, you're not an old worm, you're not a dog, and you're not just somebody that is an afterthought. You are God's purpose and focus. Colossians chapter 1. Did you turn there yet? Colossians chapter 1. And when we see that, uh, that the word of God, look, let's look at verse 9. We're talking here about number 2. You must know your redemption, the reality of your redemption in Christ. Or we could say it this way. You must understand and apply and receive the fact that you are the redeemed of the Lord. Verse 9 says this. Paul says by the Holy Ghost. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and what? And what? Everybody. With all wisdom and what? Spiritual understanding. Now, spiritual understanding means you've got to understand spiritual things. Spiritual things should not be an enigma or a mystery to you. You're supposed to under things, understand things spiritually. You're supposed to understand things soullessly. That means intellectually. And you're supposed to understand what's going on physically around you. You have been created by God in Christ Jesus to understand what's going on in and around the world and the universe and in heaven and also you should know what's going on in hell. Meaning that God explains unto you how spiritual things work. And because you are a spirit, because you are a new creature in Christ Jesus, then you must be spiritually taught. And that's what's happening right now. You're going to the Word of God, and the Word of God is training you, developing you, educating you about spiritual things, soulish things, and physical things. Here he goes on to say in verse 9, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, here it goes again. Giving thanks means I'm praising God. I'm showing out and telling God how much I appreciate this. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us. Everybody say us means me. So us means means that us is every Christian. All of us who have called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is included in the us. Now, what are you thanking God for, Paul? He said, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet. And that word meet is the old English word for able. He's made us able or meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. That means we can partake of everything that we gain knowledge of. Everything you gain knowledge of in Christ Jesus, you can partake of it. In Christ Jesus, God does not give us one Bible for women and another Bible for men. He doesn't give the Bible for some white and some black and some um, um, Asian and some you know, German and some European. No, the Bible is for all believers. And when you find out what it means that when you're told you're the redeemed of the Lord, then that is for you no matter where you live in this blue planet called Earth. Doesn't matter what country you come from, what continent you're on, it doesn't matter if you're on an island, live up in the Alps, or whether or not you live underneath the sea. <laughs> the point is, when you find out as a believer in Christ Jesus that you are the redeemed of the Lord, you can begin to lay claim to and appropriate 
the wonderful things that God has for you. Now let's read on about this. Notice it's in verse 13. Giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet or able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Who hath, and that word hath is the old, old, old word for has, who has delivered us. The word delivered doesn't mean you're going to be delivered. It says that you have been delivered. And so being delivered, is, is that a past t designation, present tense, or future tense? It is a past tense designation. You have been delivered. So everybody say, I've been delivered. That means I already am delivered. Say it again. I, I, I already am delivered. So since you have been delivered, let's find out what we have been delivered from. The word delivered could be used as the word redeemed. You've been redeemed from. You've been taken out of a condition that you were once in. And we were all sinners. We were all messes. We were all doing things that was contrary to God's will. So when he tells us that we are redeemed or we've been delivered, where were we really? He said here in verse 13, who has delivered us from the power of darkness. And that word power means the ability and the authority of darkness. And hath, has, or hath is the old English word for has, translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So since you've been translated out, uh, in, out of darkness or delivered out of darkness and translated into the kingdom of God's dear son, people, you can say this, I am the delivered. Everybody say, I'm the delivered. All the ladies say, I'm delivered. All the men say, I'm delivered. All everybody together say, I'm delivered. So when the enemy tries to tell you that you have to go under the bondage of slavery to sin. When the devil tells you, you have to be poor because the economic situations of the world demands that you're going to be poor. Or when the devil says, you got to be sick because sickness and disease is in the world and you have to be in that condition. You can say this, I am delivered. I've been delivered from poverty. I've been delivered from sickness and disease. I've been delivered from the hand of the enemy. And I'm not going to live my life trying to become something that I already am. In other words, I don't have to strive to become delivered. I already am delivered. And since I have accepted the fact that I am delivered, I walk like a delivered person. So the enemy that would try to bring circumstances to me that try to put me in a place where he once had me, which was when I was in trespasses and sins, when I walked in darkness, when I was not a child of God, the devil was, as it were, he was the God of this world and fully functioning and working in my life. But when I came to find out, I've been delivered. You know, all that manipulation stuff, it's over. That I can't help myself, I got to go do wrong, is over. That the devil made me do it, that's over. The devil is not stronger than God. And God who made me a new creature in Christ Jesus is God weaker in my life than the devil who was lording over me when I was not a child of God. No, no, no. God is stronger and greater than the devil. And too many people who are believers in Christ Jesus think that just because you are now a Christian that the devil won't try to convince you that you are, you know, you're delivered. The, I mean, or try to convince you that you are free. The devil's going to try to convince you that you're what? That you're not free. You understand what I'm trying to say here? What, I'm, I'm, what I want to say, and I'll say it in a more clear way, the devil is going to try to tell you that you're not free. 
He's going to try to tell you, you have to be subject to these things. You're going to be taken advantage of by these things. These commercials that says, and when you get mesothelioma, not if you get it, when you get it, here's the answer. When you get all of these conditions that come to those who are paying attention to this commercial, you are going to have to deal with it. No, I've been redeemed from sickness. I've been redeemed from poverty. I've been redeemed from the hand of the enemy. And I refuse to go back into bondage. I refuse to go back to the elements of the world of that nature. Amen? Amen. So here we have in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Let's all read that out loud together. It says, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of de his dearest son. One more time, and this time when we read the word us, I want you to put your name in there. So us is referring to those who are in Christ Jesus, and we're going to read this with our name there. So in my, in my Bible, I literally have written a circle around the words us, and then I put a line where I had space in my Bible, and I put my name Gary. So when I read this, I know I'm talking about me. And when you read it, you should know he's talking about you. Here, let's read it, and this time when you see the word us, I want you to say your name out loud. Let's begin, verse 13 of Colossians chapter 1. Who has delivered Gary from the power of darkness and have translated Gary into the kingdom of his dear son. Doesn't that kind of ring really strong inside of you when you know, wait a minute, I've been delivered from poverty? I've been delivered from sickness and disease? I've been delivered from the hand of the enemy? I'm no longer a sinner? I am a child of God. I have been made the redeemed of the Lord. And the Bible says the redeemed of the Lord should say so. And all of you say amen to that. Amen. All right. Number three, if you're going to receive and obtain strength and understanding and walk in the power of strong faith, you must know the reality of the new creation. You must know the reality of the new creation. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. See, when you know that you are relying on God's word to govern your life, when you're allowing God's word to be final authority to how you think and how you approach your decisions you must make in life, when you go to the word of God and determine that God's word is kind of like the dictionary of my vocabulary, I'm going to allow God's word to be that which shows me how to deal with everything I must deal with in life. When I go to work, I'm going to work as unto the Lord and not unto man. I know that there are people that are trying to tell me, oh, you know, pastor. Well, now that I'm a pastor, but when I was working in the world, outside of the ministry of the church, I, I, I literally worked for a corporation. And when I went there, the bosses wanted to know, well, what's going to be your attitude? Well, I'm going to work as unto the Lord and not unto man. That means that when you're not watching me, I know God's watching me. I know that God is watching when I punch in on the time clock. I know God is watching me and how I handle the finances. I know God is watching me how I handle the customers. I know God is watching me and how I work with and inter interact with my fellow employees. I know that I have a higher source I must account to. And since I have to account to God, boss, you don't have to worry about everything. I'm good. I'll be the most faithful the most trustworthy, I'll be the most dependable person, I'll be in early and I'll leave late. You don't have to worry about me taking long lunches and trying to skim time off the clock. One person told me years ago, they said, you know what, I love my job. It's the work I hate. <laughs> that meant they wanted to get the paycheck but didn't want to do the work. They weren't looking for the betterment of the company. See, if you're looking for the betterment of the company, then you'll know my paycheck comes from the work I do directly or indirectly to make profits for the company. I'm going to be a profitable employee. In fact, my attitude personally was this. 
I'm going to make you so much money, O oh boss. I'm going to make you so much money, you can't get rid of me. I'm going to make you so rich, you cannot get rid of me and find somebody who can do better for you than me. And somebody says, well, how much are you getting paid? Look, anybody who's being benefited by those that are making money for them are definitely going to tighten them up. Why? Because they want to make sure. You comfortable? You good? I want to make sure you good and right. Why? Because you're making so much money from me, I can't let anything happen to you. I'll look after you. Why? Because you are definitely looking after me. So when you have the attitude, I am going to work as unto the Lord and not unto man, that's the attitude that causes companies and corporations and conglomerations and so forth to grow independent businesses. You don't have to say, I'm going to always be a small business owner. Your business can thrive and grow if the attitude is right, if you align your business decisions with what the word says. And if you're blessing the customers, one time I told my father who owned his own electrical uh, contracting business, I said, Dad, it's good to be your own boss. My dad said, well, you need to first of all consider this. All of my customers, customers are my bosses. I said, what? Now, don't think I was talking to a person who didn't understand business. He had plenty of resources and wealth, and we lived very, very well. But his attitude was, all of my customers are my bosses. I see that every, every one of my customers are well cared for. And I would see him do jobs, and I would see him give jobs and not even charge people. I saw him, the way he treated the elderly and looked after the elderly, he looked after them so well, and he knew they were on a fixed income. He would, I, I knew how much he normally charged. He would be like, no, I'll pay a fraction of this. If they could, if they couldn't, he would even just write it off. My father was a great businessman. No wonder I grew up in Beverly Hills. No wonder I rode around in Rolls Royces and Mercedes Benz and Lincoln Continentals. And, and my father would always bless my mom. Why? Because he was a great businessman. So when you operate with the attitude that you what? You're, you're going to depend on the Lord, you're going to work as unto the Lord, you're going to bless the Lord, and in blessing God, you're going to bless people because people are valuable and precious to God. Everybody, everybody is valuable and precious. Nobody is insignificant in the eyes of God. I'll repeat that again. No one is insignificant in the eyes of God. Everyone is valuable and precious. And you must be a person who respects that and understands that. But now, as a new creature in Christ Jesus, we're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Did I tell you to look at that? Yes. Verse 17. Let's look at this because we're talking about the reality of the new creation. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Now, if a person says, you know what, I got a Bible, but I'm not going to turn to it and look at it, I'm letting you know now you're shortchanging yourself. This purpose of the message is to teach you how to be strong in faith because the strong in faith can speak to the mountains and the mountains will be removed. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Let's all read that out loud together. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, that beholding all things are become new is not talking about how religiously stated Songs have said, I looked at my hands and they looked new. I looked at my feet and they did too. I came to Jesus and whoo, I look different. My, everything has changed. Well, outwardly, everything may not have changed. If you were a size 10 shoe before, you size 10 shoe afterwards. If you were short before, you're short now. If you're tall before, you're tall now. In other words, short and height and uh, length, arm length span and shoe size and all that kind of stuff, that's not what he's talking about when he says, behold, all things have become new. He's talking about you spiritually. See, spiritually, if you're big on the inside, 
inside. The outward man, the physical man, can what? Can be the wonderful container for the man on the inside. And the man on the inside could be well muscled up and strong and big and tall and, and able to be what we would call a champion in your spirit. Outwardly, you may look like, man, I'm just a small frame person, but inwardly, you are powerful in the Lord. And some of you may not know what I mean when I say powerful in the Lord or powerful in your spirit. I know you can have an attitude, a determination inwardly where it's like, you know what, doesn't matter what I face. I'm, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I know I've seen little chihuahuas. In fact, I really don't like to deal with little chihuahua dogs. And the reason I don't is because they're so little and frail and small. But the, the attitude them little creatures have they, they're always trying to whoop up on. They're always trying to attack. They're always, you know what I mean? In fact, when I was a little kid, I got bitten by a chihuahua because I'm thinking it's down here where I am. And I went to pet it, and that thing tried to bite me. And then when I tried to run from it, it tried to run after me. I'm like, what is this? And, and, I, and I come to find out that that particular breed, it, that dog, the personality of it is, is it's like does it, it has a complex. Or for it, it's the normal way to function. I'm going to get you no matter how big you are. I could have kicked it, and I don't know when it would have come down from the kick. <laughs> Point being is, it's not how big the dog is. It's the attitude of the dog. Are you with me? And so I remember hearing a story about a mom. This is before the, the car seats were required on the front seat of the car. And she told her little son, she said, sit down, son, and strap in. And the son wasn't sitting down strapping in. He would stand up on the seat. She said, sit down and strap in, son. And he wouldn't sit down and strap in. Finally, she reached over from the driver's side, and she jerked him down and made him sit in the seat. And she clicked in his, his seat belt and said, I said, sit down. And then she saw him out of the corner of her eye. He was like this. She said, why do you have that stern look on your face? He said, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> so what I'm talking about is your attitude as a believer in Christ Jesus. You've got to be stronger in here than what's going on outside of you. You've got to be confident that your, your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, your faith in the word of God will prevail you and avail you over any and everything the world can throw at you and the devil can throw at you. The Bible says to be aware, to know, to look at, pay attention, that everything has become new. What do you mean everything has become new? You are a new creation. You are a new person. You are an entity that never existed before. You're a new species. Some translations read it that way. It reads, you are a new species. What kind of species is that? You have become a child of the living God. And he lives on the inside of you. So you are a God child, if you want to say it that way. Looking at, you still there in 2 Corinthians? All right, look at the sixth chapter. Second Corinthians chapter six, so you'll know it's all right here in context. Paul the apostle writing by the Spirit of God. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse 14. Because you are a new creature in Christ Jesus, you gotta act like what you actually are. Now, somebody says, well, you ain't changed. You're talking about Jesus wearing a cross on your neck, but you're still doing the same stuff you used to do. That's because uh, you just are ignorant. <laughs> you're just ignorant, acting foolishly, acting outside of your real character. How many of you have ever seen The Lion King? You ever seen The Lion King? Where were, who could say that they've never seen The Lion King? Okay, well, I remember in The Lion King, the statement that James Earl Jones, the, what was he? He was what, Mufasa? He was Mufasa, the chief lion over his little son Simba, right? And he said to his son, never forget who you are. I said, man, that's a powerful statement, especially when James Earl Jones, he just, he just, mm. I'm like, mm, I felt that. <laughs> never forget who you are. Look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. 
Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord or agreement hath Christ with Belial? Belial is another name for the devil. Or what part of he that believeth with an infidel? Infidel is somebody who is not trustworthy, has no fidelity. Verse 16. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye, or you, are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, or because of this, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. He's letting you know, you're not like you used to be. You're not, you're not a child of the devil anymore. Turn over to Ephesians. Well, keep your finger here. Let's all, uh, this is so good. Okay, hold on, hold on. This is so, so good. Let's read this out loud together, verse 14. Let's read out loud together because he's describing you, O oh Christian. Everybody say, he's describing me, describing who, is who is a Christian. Now notice this. I'm gonna, let's all read this out loud. And every descriptive word that he uses of you, who is a Christian, I want you to take note of it by either underlining it or circling it or highlighting it because it's a description of you. Now he's also going to describe those who are not Christians, and we'll see that. But I want you to pay close attention to you. Verse 14. Let's all read it out loud together. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So that, that means that an unbeliever couldn't be what? Couldn't be you. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? So circle the word righteousness because you're called righteousness. See, you're in school. That's what church is. Church is school. What's the textbook? The Bible. So here we see that he calls us righteousness. Now he tells us who are right with God not to be in communication as if those who are not right with God are the same as us, because they're not. You are a believer, they're called unbeliever. You're called righteousness, they're called unrighteousness. And what communion hath light, circle the word light, because light is a description of you, O believer. You're called light, and the unbeliever is called darkness. Verse 15, and what concord hath Christ? That's you, O believer, you're called Christ. With Belial. Belial is another name for the devil. So who is he talking about? The non-believer is called the devil. A non-believer is called a child of the devil. The believer is called Christ. The believer is called light. The believer is called righteousness. The believer is called a believer. So here in verse 15, and what conquered hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth Let's circle that because it's talking about you with an infidel. So a non-believer is called infidel. Verse 16. And what agreement hath the temple of God? Circle the words temple of God because that's referring to you. That means your body is the temple for the living God that dwells on the inside of you. And a non-believer is called with idols. For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them. So where is God now? Inside of who? I'll say that again. Where is God? He's inside of you, O believer. That means whatever you're doing, guess who's on the scene? See, there are some believers that say, I can do what I want to do. Yeah, I'm a Christian. When I die, I'm going to heaven. But you know what? Before I get to heaven, I'm going to do what I want to do because it's my world. I can do what I want to do. It's my body. I can do what I want to do. Uh, let's find out. <laughs> he says, you're the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come up from among them 
Be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons, that's referring to you, and daughters, that's referring to you, O women of God, saith the Lord Almighty. Now turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians, the book just before 2 Corinthians. So that's the book just before 2 Corinthians is called 1 Corinthians. Are y'all learning something today? Yeah. Are you glad you're here in school? Is the information something that's changing your conviction, changing your strength of conviction? Now, in other words, I may have come in believing God for so much, but now that I'm learning about who I am and how God looks at me, I'm going to believe him like this. Why? Because he is my father. Because his word is final authority in my life. Because I'm the redeemed of the Lord. And God didn't redeem me for me to live like a slave. God didn't redeem me for having to have the worst in life or try to live a mediocre life. He didn't raise me up so that I could live like a pauper. He didn't heal me so that I could accept sickness and disease. He didn't make me his very own child so I can run around talking about I don't know what God may do. If anybody should know what God is doing, if anybody should know how God thinks, if anybody should be godly in the decisions that they make, it should be the children of God and that's what you are, a child of God. That's why when somebody tries to sell me a load of craziness and tell me that it could be the truth, I know truth when I hear truth because Jesus said I'm the way, the truth, and the life and no man can come to the Father except by me. And Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? And Jesus said in John chapter 17, thy word is truth. God's word is the truth. My confidence in the word is confidence in the truth and the truth shall never change. You're there in 1 Corinthians chapter 6? All right, look at this. Verse 15. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee for an occasion, not walk away from it. Hey, hey, what'd you say? say? Say what? Let me hear it again. What'd you say, sweet thing? No, 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 that's not it. The Bible says flee for an occasion. Don't play around with it. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That means God's possession. Your body belongs to God. You can't tell God what you're going to do with what he owns. How many of you ever leased a car before? Did you notice when you lease a car, you don't just run around and do what you want to with it? You consciously thinking about the miles you're putting on it. You're thinking about the, my keeping up with the maintenance schedule on it. If it gets scratched, I better get it fixed. Why? Because I turn this thing in. When I turn it in, I got to make sure it doesn't have any scratches on it. So therefore, because of your knowledge of who really owns the vehicle, it changes the way you behave. It changes the way you think. It changes the way how you prioritize your money. And he says here, you better act like your body belongs to God, because it does. Yeah. Well, I don't like that what it says. You can, hey, look, you may not like it, but one thing for sure, this is what it says. Well, I don't like it. Well, then are you telling me that the price of freedom is too high for you? One day I was praying and the Lord said to me, Gary, you know why some people don't like freedom? Why? Because it brings responsibility. See, liberty, once you know that you are free in Christ, but you're free at the cost of Christ, now you owe, you owe God. See, you owe him. Well, I don't feel like it. It has nothing to do with feeling. Where have you ever gone where you have been told, I'm giving you this and no obligation is attached to it? There's no such thing as giving without obligation. There's always obligation. If I was the mafia kingpin, 
handing you a million dollars, you'd be like, wait a minute, wait a minute, what do you do? I said, I'm a mafia drug selling, pimp snorting, coke dealing, uh, <laughs> prostituting, you know, do I do it all. In other words, all the corruption. I'm all about the corruption. Here, take this million dollar gift. I want to give it to you. Oh, no, 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 no. Now, if I didn't know what you was doing, I may have accepted the money because God's always good. But where are you coming from? No, no. There's something attached to that. Oh, men, if your wives are going to work and she comes home with a diamond necklace and tells you her boss gave that to her. <laughs> Say what? Well, was this your anniversary? No, it ain't no anniversary. 20 years? No, no. He just said he likes me the way I look with this golden diamond necklace. I have news for you right now, old men. <laughs> How many of you men would go for that? I'd be like, no, no, take it back, give it to him. If I, if I like you in a diamond necklace, I'll get you one. But I'm not trying to have you influenced by his gift. Why? Because there's no such thing as giving without expectation and, and uh, of uh, obligation. God gave you salvation, but you best be believing he expects you to respond like you're redeemed. And I have to quit because I ran out of time. Oh, what a blessing it is. Have you learned something today? Can we give God the glory? Let's thank him in Jesus' name for giving us insight and wisdom about our obligations because his commandments are not grievous. He only wants the best for us, and it's a blessing to give him our heart and our I want to thank you for tuning in today's lesson. If you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then I'm going to lead you into a confession of faith. If you say these words after me, you can become a child of the living God. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Let us pray these words now, believing these words in our heart and saying them with our mouth. Dear God, I believe in my heart you sent your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for my sins. He was crucified. His blood was shed to wash me clean. And dear God, you raised him from the dead. So I confess with my mouth, now Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior. You are alive. I believe this in my heart. And because I confess you as my Lord, I am now a child of the living God. Father, thank you for making me your very own. I will live for you. you are in Jesus' name, amen. That never goes. I'd like to thank you for your continual support of this broadcast of Spirit Food Christian Center. We're so grateful for your participation. I'd like to give you an opportunity to participate by our Push Pay app. Text my SFCC to the number 77977. You'll receive further instruction on how to give. We're so grateful and thankful for your continual support and love. Remember, you're helping to make it happen. In Jesus' name, you amen. Are the sun.